And welcome back to Israel Mobile Summit. Uh, so we had already some interesting insights uh, about monetization in apps, how things changed for the past year. And now let's talk about miraculous partnerships. What are ways to successfully license intellectual property on a video game? We have the exactly right person to tell us all about it. So please meet Eleanor Shops, VP of Gaming Experience from Zach Entertainment. Hi, Eleanor. Uh, can you please unmute yourself so we can hear yeah. you? Oh, yeah, now we can. Hi, okay. how are you? How are you? Good, how are you? Yeah, awesome. Uh, you like a veteran uh, in, amongst gaming executives. You were VP in Crazy Labs, right? Before that. Correct. And now, now you're VP and Zach. And you and if I remember cor correctly, Zach are also uh, IP owners of the animated car uh, character Ladybug, right? Correct. Miraculous Ladybug in Cat Noir. Correct. Awesome. Yes, yeah, so that's why I said you're exactly the right person to tell us all about it. So I'm just uh, passing. I'm just passing over to you and have a nice speech. Good luck. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Bonjour. Shalom. I wanted to start off by thanking Ophir for inviting me to speak today. I'll start off with a very short introduction about Zag, about Miraculous Ladybug, and about myself. Uh, my name is Elino, and I'm the VP of Gaming at Zag. I'm the founding member of Zag Gaming. Zag Gaming is an Israeli company, and we are a gaming arm of Zag, American, an American company and a sister company to Zag Tune, a French company. In addition to my professional capacity, I'm also the, founding, uh, the founder of the Women in Games community in Israel. It's known as Nashimba Gaming, which now includes almost 500 professionals working in the Israeli gaming industry. Briefly about Zag, as you can see, we are the creator of this magnificent TV show. Um, in Hebrew, the show is called the Chikushita Mupla'a. It's a high-end CGI action adventure show for the entire family. The show is packed with action and comedy and tells the story of a French teenager. You can see her on the left. By day, she's a schoolgirl. She's named Mar Marinette. And by night, she becomes a superhero called Ladybug. The show is available in 120 different markets global globally with a jaw-dropping rating. We just finished rolling out season four with a huge cliffhanger. And now um, I'm happy to, to announce that Disney has picked up the show all the way to season seven. Apart from that, we are also working on a theatrical movie release, which will be available next year in cinemas around the world and then available for streaming. Moving on to Zag Gaming. Um, as I mentioned, the company is Israeli. Uh, we were founded here last year. Uh, we're a business unit and we work with partners to launch game based on our miraculous IP. Happy to share that this year alone, we have launched a successful Roblox game. We were the first TV show to enter the metaverse. Um, and we have done that with a great partner, Toya, also an Israeli company. Uh, the game was launched back in May this year and already crossed 270 million plays with zero user acquisition. I know most of the, the audience here comes from the mobile space. So I'm going to say it again, 270 million plays with zero user acquisition. All of this was achieved organically. Next, we'll be launching um, an RPG bubble shooter with our longtime partner, Crazy Labs. And that's expected next quarter. In addition, we are in mid-production of a new console game. That is expected next Christmas, 22. Um, that will be for Switch, Nintendo, for Nintendo Switch, for Xbox, PlayStation, and then Steam and Epic. Another exciting venture is a VR experience that is also planned for 2022. Okay. Now, briefly about me. Um, I have a dark secret in my past. I used to be a lawyer. And this little kitty cat used to be my first client. I was just an intern at the time, but my role was to protect Kitty from unauthorized use of her registered mark. That was the first time I fully understood the commercial value of an IP. Many years have passed since then, and along the years I have made the transition from the legal side to the commercial side. Um, in the past 15 years, I've been leveraging business development expertise with corporate marketing, operating in companies um, in the field of communication, media, and gaming space. 
As was mentioned uh, before joining Zag, I was the VP of Business Development at Crazy Labs, before then Gravity Creative Space, and before then One Sport Israel. This means I was on both sides of these licensing deals. I used to be a licensor, then moved to being a licensee, and then back to the licensor. Um, this means I have a lot of um, experience in this field, um, what makes these deals successful and also what makes them a bit more challenging. Now let's move to the topic that we're here for best practices, how to successfully license, license an IP for a video. Let's first understand the landscape. If you check the App Store on any given day, you'll be able to recognize some familiar faces as you can see here on the screen, um, like Disney, Nickelodeon, Harry Potter, and many others. Not every publisher actually wants to work with a brand, right? Some work on their original IP, but then some, some publishers consider working with an IP and the purpose of our talk today is to see why does it make sense and perhaps it doesn't make sense for everyone. Let's dive in. First, when evaluating an opportunity to partner with the brand, you need to, to make sure that the brand and you, the publisher, are in agreement what you're expecting to achieve. For example, some brands consider games as a marketing tool. They would consider developing a game the same way they would consider launching a Facebook campaign, for example. Um, their goal is to build awareness to drive sales somewhere else, not necessarily in the gaming space. For example, they have a new movie, they have a new TV show, they, they have a new consumer products program. It's important to understand that this is the case because it means that the brand might favor the appearance of the brand, how polished it looks, over monetization, because who wants those messy ads interrupting? Another expression of brand awareness um, is actually, you can see the examples here on the screen, um, is what elite fashion brands are doing these days in the gaming world and NFT space. Take, for example, um, Ralph Lauren, Gucci, and Vans. Um, all of these brands have launched an experience in the, couple of, uh, in the last couple of months. Obviously, the kids playing Roblox are not your typical Ralph Lauren or Gucci customers, but this is the brand's investment in the next generation of clients. Sometimes these brands are also counting on the fact that these kids have parents around them um, that might appreciate buying a virtual Gucci bag. On the other hand, um, some brands are operating in the gaming space in order to build a new source of revenue a new source of revenue, excuse me, in the immediate, in the immediate future. Um, this game has to stand on its own merits in order to, to create a steady revenue stream. Take any Scopely, Gem City, Electronic Arts, or even our games. This applies to our games. We consider those games a new source of revenues and not a marketing. Here are a few examples of what fashion brands are doing today in the gaming space. Fantastic examples, but this is, all of these are brand awareness examples. Let's move on. So given you are in agreement with the brand about the purpose of the game, it is now time to move to the next step and see which business terms make sense the most. Licensing. From a brand perspective, this is the safest bet. This usually includes some kind of MG, some kind of minimum guarantee, which is usually recoupable. And then it is followed by an, a revenue share in favor of the risk taker here. Uh, let's, let's take, for example, that the developer is financing the entire production. This means that they will get the majority of the revenue share and then pay a percentage to the brand. Um, the, the MG and the revenue share um, are both dependent on the platform at hand. If you take a mobile game, the cost of development and the cost to ship the product are not the same as console game. And that's why sometimes the revenue share between platforms might change. Um, as a publisher, you should always try to guarantee a rollout window plus some grace in terms of genre exclusivity. The second model I'd like to mention is the work for hire. Usually this means the brand is paying for the development in order to then continue to publish the game on its own. In my opinion, it's a big mistake on the brand side. 
because most brands don't have the capacity or the experience in this field to take the app publishing in a way that will compete with major publishers. The third model is joint venture, split the risks, split the revenue share and join the game and equally um, own the game. So now the, that we uh, covered the business sides of it, let's discuss what might be the upsides to working with a brand around the launch of the game and then during live ops. Around the launch of the game, um, in some cases, the brand has such an organic appeal that you can actually save on some user acquisition. It doesn't mean you'll be able to save on everything, but it means that the, the brand has such a strong followers and they will continue to download the game even with less user acquisition. Moving on, we have um, what store editors, what they prefer to see. They love these branded games and they tend to promote them, um, which again might lead to, to less user acquisition. Um, usually branded games are also high production. Um, I can give you an example from our specific console game. Our TV show uh, director and head writer have developed new characters, part of our universe, and they will make their first appearance in the console game. So for fans, that's an amazing story and that we expect that this will go viral. Um, also, from a PR perspective, that's a great story. The fourth bullet here, and I think that's the most interesting one actually, is that premium content, usually fans are more likely to pay for in a purchase if, this, if it's a brand that they love. During live ops, that's a very effective way to keep retention high during live ops. Take for example, our universe, but also any Marvel universe or DC comics. There are so many characters and you can continue to introduce new content for a long time. Also, we're talking about a great tool to attract new type of users. I'm going to show an example. I'm going to skip ahead for a second, just to give you an example. Um, this is a great um, example by uh, Saber. That's a sports app uh, that you can play on your Oculus device. Uh, usually the type of uh, Oculus users are, they tend to be men um, and um, Saber have, have launched two campaigns in the past few months. You should check them out. Uh, they're trying to attract new users, which are female. So check out these two ads, they're amazing. And they, they will show you how these, uh, how, how Beat Saber are trying to really attract women as users. So now let's continue. Okay. In any case, if you're uncertain um, about working with a brand or for a brand to work with a publisher, um, you can always minimize the risk by starting small, do brand integration. Uh, this means that you can cap the development time, you can cap the user acquisition, and you can cap your risk. This applies to both sides, as I mentioned. Um, also the IP owner who wants to protect the brand and not quite sure how the publisher will perform. And also from the publisher who's not really sure he wants to start working with an external stakeholder that has its own opinion and might have effect on the production. Here, here are some great examples. We don't have time to cover everything, um, but I'm here for any follow-up questions if you'd like. Um, obviously, this was announced last week. That's a great example of a brand integration. And on the left here, that was actually also announced last week. Fall Guys um, are now doing an integration with Nightmare Before Christmas. Um, on the right, you can see um, an integration of Timmy and T and Smite. Um, the way I see it, this is also uh, for Timmy and T, an opportunity to explore new type of game genres that they might have not considered before because Smite is, a, is MMO, um, is a bit more sophisticated, a bit more violent. Um, and that's a great way to see if their audience has matured um, 
this way. Um, potential downsides to working with the brand. More stakeholders, I've mentioned this before. Um, from the brand side, you, you might have directors, producers, screenwriters, talents, and so on and so forth. This means more opinions, longer approval rounds. Um, also, um, a potential downside that is that um, working with a brand will require a bigger financial commitment because you have to pay an MG, you have to share the revenue with another party. Um, other potential downsides, you have hard deadlines, especially if you're committing to release a game around the movie release or a new season. Um, as a user, if you don't like the brand, there is no way you will download the game. Take, for example, the Katy Perry app below or Nicki Minaj. If you're not a fan, there is no way you will download those games. Um, the last thing which I'd like to mention is this might also cause some bad PR and some bad attention. Um, returning to the example of Katy Perry and Nicki Minaj, both games were performed really badly and were removed from sale. Um, another example is the Ghostbusters um, integration inside Fortnite. Um, Sony got some bad reviews uh, from super fans who thought that this is not the right execution for their favorite brand. Um, and here are some other examples, which to me uh, show that sometimes a brand integration isn't right, isn't just right. For example, um, if you don't recognize the game, this is, an, uh, this is Animal Crossing. Um, and on the right, you can see an example of Joe Biden that was before he was elected. Um, he decided to run a campaign inside the game. Why? Not quite sure, but it created some marketing buzz and that was reported in the news. So perhaps that was the reason. Um, that's all the time we have today, I think. I'm going to skip this one, but I do want to show you a farewell from us at Zag, uh, just because it's the end of the year, we're coming close. And I want to show you this fantastic sizzle. So.
Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you as well. And it was so nice to see Lady Buck in the end. I felt a little bit of nostalgic, actually. What was it? Six years, I think, passed since since the first movie was launched. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, we are pretty tight on schedule. We don't have uh, yeah, time for questions, but please, guys, feel free to, to, re to reach out in case you have any. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and once again, thank you very much for, for, a, you. Great, for a great speech. Yeah, and uh, have a happy upcoming holidays. <laughs> thank you. You too. Yeah. Bye-bye.